in Genesis 41, looking at the life of Joseph, this will be part five. Uh, I didn't intend to go this long, but it keeps jumping off the page, so we, we ain't got nothing but the Bible to go through anyway, so until we go home to be with the Lord. Uh, there is a lot of things we've seen. Uh, remember Joseph was 17 when he uh, was put in the pit. We're going to find out later on in this study today that he was 30 years old when he become uh, over the land of Pharaoh over Egypt. And so we, we finished last week, basically in Genesis 41, talking about the chief butler, uh, you know, remembering the dream that Joseph interpreted for him. And then Pharaoh in verse number 14, sent and called Joseph. Remember, Joseph didn't, <clears throat> I'm sure didn't have any idea he was going about his daily routine. And all of a sudden, he'd been summoned by the king to show up. Because the Bible says they brought him hastily out of uh, his dungeon. And what a got to be wondering what in the world is going through his head as he's leaving the dungeon, missing to go into the palace. I go, okay, <laughs> is this going to be it or what? <laughs> I mean, is this, what's this going to happen? And uh, God surprises us a lot of times like it. God works behind the scenes, and that's what we're really going to look at this morning and, and draw out from the Word of God. But Joseph stood before him in verse uh, 15, and he Pharaoh mentioned the dream that he dreamed unto Joseph. And of course, verse 17 through 37, we talked about the dream interpreted was seven years of famine and seven years of plenty. But you remember back in verse 16, Joseph told Pharaoh, hey, it's not me that can interpret dreams, but God can, and God's going to give you a very clear answer. And I think that's about where we left off last week. So... And as I said in verse 17 through 37, that dream interpreted uh, was seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And Joseph told Pharaoh, you must prepare for this because it's going to come to pass. Now, I wish we had sometimes, uh, you know, maybe we would like 14 years of our life to be given to us that's ahead of us. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we want that. Mm -hmm. And all the emotions and changes and right. things going through. But see, that's how God works in His sovereignty. That's how God does things. But He did give uh, Pharaoh a charge by Joseph, told him, you're going to have to prepare for this because it's going to happen. And, and I thought about Proverbs 16, 1, the preparations of the heart inside man or in man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. God put something in us naturally to want to prepare for things. You can see it all around us every day how that some people, even though they're lost, they do preparations for the future. Uh, just because someone is not saved doesn't mean they do their God-given, uh, not necessarily a talent, but a, a God-given thing that they naturally do because God put it in us to prepare. It's something we, we slack all the time. We, we, we see and we read through Proverbs about the slothful man. He didn't prepare because it was cold outside. And the Bible says he'll suffer hunger uh, come wintertime. He'll, he won't have nothing to eat because he didn't prepare. And then he talks about these little animals and he talks about the ant in Proverbs. Uh, though the smallest of creatures, yet they work all summer preparing and laying up for the winter that is coming ahead. So all those are examples for us. Well, Joseph done the same thing, and he, he told Pharaoh, said, you're going to have to prepare for this. So we have a, a clear answer from the Lord that this is something that God puts into every one of his creations to do. Even a lost man will say, what, you got to put aside something for a rainy day. Problem is, we really don't do that. We just kind of spend what we got mm -hmm. and wonder why we ain't got nothing. That's just sort of the way things happen. Now, I don't know. How, I don't know what it's like to uh, have a job where you got a consistent pay. Never experienced that. 
Mine is fluctuates big time. <laughs> and it's crazy the fluctuation that takes place in that. So, but the, the principle is the same. It doesn't matter. We're to lay up for a rainy day. Now, again, the vision has been given, the dream has been interpreted that uh, this time of famine is going to come, time of goodness and plenty first. And so now we get down to verse 25 and 28. We see this phrase, God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Now, verse 25, Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. Remember, it looked like two different dreams, but it was really one. And God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. You say, well, wait a minute. Uh, Pharaoh is a man that doesn't seek God, that doesn't look after God, don't want to seek God daily. Yet God really didn't show Pharaoh because Pharaoh couldn't understand. That's why he got a man of God who can interpret dreams to come and reveal that. So through Joseph, now God has revealed what he's going to do to Pharaoh. You see, the scripture talks about in, that, uh, in John, I think it's chapter nine uh that god heareth not sinners but if any man be a worshiper of god and doeth his will him will he hear well what's his will his will is for everyone to repent of their sins and believe in the lord jesus christ as savior now so if god seems to answer a prayer from a lost man he really doesn't god answers the prayer of a saved man praying for the lost man and so this is the same thing here he couldn't interpret the dream but Joseph did, the man of God, and so by that the answer came and God showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The same thing in verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh, what God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. So he, he made the emphasis there twice that God has showed Pharaoh what he's going to do. So Pharaoh had one or two options, to believe Joseph or not to believe him. Mm -hmm. And see, that's the truth. The scripture says we can do nothing of the truth but for the truth. The truth doesn't change. When Jesus stood before Pilate and Pilate said, what is truth? Truth was standing before him. Truth doesn't change. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but through me or by me. So the truth doesn't change. You can, you, you can believe this is a piece of wood right here or not. I, you, can, you can say this is a piece of granite. Well, I don't care what you say. This is a piece of wood. Yeah. It doesn't change the fact that the truth is the truth. And so he's interpreting this, and the truth is now before Pharaoh. Well, you got to remember, there was no one else in the land all of Pharaoh's magicians and stuff, they couldn't interpret this dream. Now, God has plainly showed Pharaoh what the dream is, and so he had to just believe what he's been told because no one else could interpret it. So, verse 29, basically seven years of great plenty. Look at this. And it says that, Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And I'm just going to skip a few verses as we go down through here looking at it. So the seven years of great plenty on an ungodly nation. you got to remember, they, didn't, they, they had all these different gods. And what is the first thing God said in the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before Amen. me. That's right. He said, I am a jealous God. So why would a jealous God, why would a holy God bless an ungodly nation with all these other gods. He had a purpose, and that is to take care of his children. So there were seven years of great plenty on an ungodly nation, but God has a plan. He will bless an ungodly nation. He will cause a nation to prosper that doesn't even acknowledge who he is so he can sustain his people in whom he has redeemed. We've seen in our study over these chapters that we've covered now, it's been several chapters. You remember, we only skipped one, really, uh, from basically Genesis 37, and we're still going through. 
But we've seen in these chapters how God is working in a Gentile nation. It's amazing how all this is being revealed. Basically, this is some behind-the-scenes stuff that we really don't always see, but God is working. So he's working in this Gentile nation. In the meantime, his chosen people, his redeemed people, they seem to be silent in the background. All these chapters we covered and the chapters we're going to, you hardly ever see anything about J uh, Joseph, his father, or the nation of Israel. They seem to be silent in all of these chapters. So for the most part, they're not mentioned, yet God is working in their lives. Now, a couple of lessons here. In Genesis chapter 11 and verse 31 and 32, we have recorded what some title the wasted years. This is uh, Terah, which is uh, as Abraham's father. By the way, Terah means delay. I, don't get. We're going to see in a moment these names. Even the names Joseph named his two sons. They all meant something. Believe it or not, look up your name. It means something. Look it up. Just that, you ain't got to look it up now. You can Google it. I don't care. It ain't gonna bother me. You can do that and listen. That don't, stuff don't bother me, but your name means something. It especially meant something. If not, God wouldn't reveal to us so many times why he named the children that he did. So, Terah here was, uh, means delay. And so, they left the earth of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. They was on a mission. They came to Haran and dwelt there, and they stayed there till Terah died. And then in chapter 12, we see where God told Abraham to get out of that land of the earth of the Chaldees. Now, we really don't know how many years they stayed in the land because I think when Terah had Abram, he was, I think he was 70, something I have to go back and look at it in Genesis chapter 11. But I think he was around 70 when he had Abram and he died at 200 and something years old. So I don't know how long the pilgrimage was and how long they stayed there in the Ur of the, well, they left Ur of the Chaldees and stayed there uh, in the land of Haran. But anyway, there was a lot of years and it's been sort of tied of the wasted years, if you will, because God was moving them to Canaan. But you know what? Between Genesis 12 until the children of Israel got in Canaan was a lot of wasted years, and if you want to tie it that. A lot of things happen during that span of time. But in, in the time that they was in that land till chapter 12, and God told Abram to get out of the land of the earth, the Chaldees, uh, we can title those times in Abraham's life the wasted years, but God was working in the silence in the heart of Abraham to prepare him to be able to obey him when he told him what to do. And so, think about it now. Those years, it's not recorded what all went on in, in Abraham's life, or Abram at that time. But no doubt, God was in the silence of that time, working in the hearts of his people. There has to be some preparation done for obedience. And if God hadn't been working in the heart of Abram, there's no way he would have obeyed him when God told him to go to the land and uh, I'm not going to tell you where it is. Just go. Mm -hmm. That took some faith. So God was working in those silent times in his life. Also in the scripture between Malachi and Matthew, we have what's known as the 400 years of silence. Now, can you imagine, you say there's 400 years of silence. Well, simply what that means is between Malachi and Matthew, those 400 years, there was not, a, you see, God was speaking from Genesis to Malachi the, through the prophets and all that, but no new prophets arose. No new revelation was given on the Word of God at that time. Doesn't mean that for 400 years, God left His people in silence. God was hearing their prayers. They were still families getting, uh, having children and raising children. A life was going on for 400 years. But it was just silence is what we tend to call it because 
between Malachi and Matthew, between Malachi I give his last prophecy, and then uh, John the Baptist and Jesus came on the scene, was roughly about 400 years. But God was working, and the truth of the matter is, God's working even when you and I don't see or hear Him working. There are silent years in our children's lives while we're raising them. Look, but look back over your children's lives. You're raising them. And it's until they get older and usually out of the house till you start seeing some results of your raising. How many times have we said this? They, that's just their raising. They can't help it. I say that a lot. People that act like a fool. <laughs> act like they ain't got no raising. Yep. Because they don't. Right. Amen. Amen. They got no manners. Yeah. No. Yeah. I told my kids, I said, you even hear me. I got people that I work for that are younger than I am, and I still, I can show you texts, and I can show you an answer. It's yes, sir, no, sir. That's right. Still. Yep. And I'm 20, 25 years older than they are. But I work for them. It's respect. It's raising. Right. <laughs> Amen. Man, have we forget that. I, see, school teachers will bless your heart. I know. Amen. Johnny, can I help you with something? Nah. No. Mm -hmm. I hear it in the church house. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, we got we got a generation, I even know some pastors that won't even make their, they're younger now, but won't even make their kids say yes sir and no sir and yes ma'am and no mm -hmm. ma'am. It's pathetic. It is. And I just throw that out there and you shut the thing off if you want to. Mm -hmm. I can't help it. That's just the way it is. They ain't got no raising. What, what's wrong with it? Amen? But we see all that and we think that God is not working in our children's life, yet He's preparing them as, he, as we go along. They, those seem like silent years, but God is doing a work. God is preparing them, and here's the truth of the matter, through our examples. The only way they're going to know to serve God is to see mom and daddy do it. Amen. That's the bottom line. And so we, we see those years there of great plenty throughout the land. Verse 30. We come, and I've shared this recently, but we come to a sad but true statement here. He said, There shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine shall consume the land. The sad statement is here, but it's true, all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land. You say, well, that's just talking about that famine. No, this still happens to us today. We allow our present circumstances to consume our thoughts today. In times of famine, we forget how God daily loads us with benefits. We do it all the time. Why? We're self-centered focused it's what's happening now yes God's moved in the past yes God's done things in the past yes God God has paid my bills when I didn't have no money God has fed me when I didn't have nothing to eat God has sustained me when I didn't have nothing God has done all these things yet can he do it again right now with what I'm going through that's what happens in the land here there was seven years of famine, or seven years of plenty. Now, the famine has come, and the people have forgotten all the plenty that they had. Ain't nothing changed. It's the same way in our lives. Now, verse 33, as we move on down. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Now, here... Joseph wasn't candidating for the position. He was just giving him some advice. Here's what you need to do. In other words, if I got an ear for you to hear me, Pharaoh, this is what you need to do. You need to find you a man in this land that's discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. I'm sure Joseph was preparing to go right back down to the dungeon. Mm -hmm. He come, he interpreted he laid it out what's going to happen, and I'm sure he was ready to go back. 
to his dungeon, to his prison cell, to where he was a member, was in charge even of the prisoners down there. See, he had a life of leadership. Mm -hmm. Everywhere he went, God put him in a position. It's no different than you and I. You're not here by accident. Mm -hmm. God has positioned you here. And you have a position. And you have something to do. So he, he tells him, you need to find you a wise, godly person in your land to prepare this time that share to come. Now, uh, in paraphrasing and going through here from verse 38 through 44, Pharaoh sees the favor of God in the life of Joseph. Pharaoh says, God has given me this man and it's you. So now Joseph finds himself, according to verse 46, as we look down through there, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh. So Pharaoh said, I found him, and I'm talking to him. All these positions that he has had of leadership, Joe, uh, Pharaoh said, look, I, I know who it is. I'm talking to the man, and it's you. So now Joseph finds himself 30 years old. Also, verse 45, Joseph had been given a wife. So now he's 30 years old. And he's married, and and he's married to a Gentile bride. Ain't that something? God's took him out of his native land, Jew, Hebrew, put him into a ruler's position in Egypt, which is always a what a type of the world in the Scripture. And now he has a Gentile bride that was given to him, and so a lot of things have happened in his life. So now that's the picture that. Joseph and Jesus as we're his Gentile bride. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great picture of that. Now, he was 17 when he was cast into the pit. 17 years old. And now he's 30. So 13 years later, he's in the palace. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, don't tell me your life can't change in 13 <laughs> years. Mine's changed in the last 13 years. Hey, I'm getting, I'm things hurt that don't fit you hurt. Hey, <laughs> man, get up and yeah. <laughs> Lots of things happened in the last 13 years. But he's went from the pit to the palace, to the palace, excuse me. But notice Joseph now is 30 years old. That's no accident. A high priest, according to 1 Chronicles 23.3, had to be 30 years old to work the work of a priest. Jesus was baptized and began his public ministry at 30 years old. That is no accident that it is given the age here. Now verse 48. Joseph gathered up all the food for seven years. He said, by verse 47, 46, basically 47 says he went through all the land. In verse 48, he gathered up all the food of seven years. Now, uh, it kind of, you remember, well, you're going to see it as we go through, as you study through the Word of God, when he would rain down manna during those times, he told them, you just get what you need today. And you remember, they got all them quail, mm -hmm. and they stuffed them, mm -hmm. and they stuffed them, and they hid them, they done all these things. And the Bible says that it even come out of their nostrils, this is gross, but have you ever been so sick? Mm. Yeah, you have. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it even comes out your nose. That's awful. That is awful, boy. <laughs> and so, I, I've been there. I'm sure you have. You throw it up enough, I guarantee you. It's, so, imagine those things. Yet here, God has plainly said, look, you gather up for seven years, it's okay. And again, he had to prepare for these things. So he goes about, he gathers up food for seven years. Verse 49. It was so much Joseph couldn't even number the blessings of the Lord on the land. Look at this. Joseph gathered corn as much as the sand of the sea. We see that throughout the scripture, don't we? As we see that, uh, that, that means there's no number. Very much until he left numbering. For it was without number. It's just too much. Joe said, I ain't counting no more. 
You ain't got to count on what. Maybe they didn't have a Roman numeral that would go that high. And even in the scriptures, you'll see ten thousands and thousands and thousands because it's an innumerable number. Read it through the book of Revelation. Read it in Jude. You'll find that throughout the Word of God. So it was just without number there was so much. Verse 50 through 52. Now watch this. God gave Joseph two sons before the famine. The firstborn was named Manasseh. And that means, for God had made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Now, Joseph's life has so much changed in these 13 years. He said, you know what? I, I, you give me a son. Here, there in verse 50, it says, And Joseph was born two sons before the years of the famine came. And then he said in verse 51, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, he, not Joseph now, God has turned his world around so much that he had made me forget all my toil. What a glorious day. And all my father's house. Yeah. You know what? There was a healing that took place when that, bo that boy was born. Yeah. Sometimes there's got to come a time in our place when we learn to forgive. And that's what Joseph did. It took 13 years, according to this. <laughs> you know, you say, well, forgive and forget. No, you ain't going to ever forget it. Mm -mm. You won't forget it. You will not forget it. Because she's thinking about it right now. <laughs> she ain't forgot it, but what you got to do when you remember it, they then you go. gotta choose to forgive. That's where the seventy times seven comes in. And if you think about it four hundred and ninety times, and you got another four hundred and ninety, and you got another four hundred and ninety. And that's what Jesus was teaching in that principle. Yet things were so good in his life, he said, I don't forgot all my toil, everything I've been through. See, there was times of depression in his life. You know they was. Yeah. That's right. Times he wanted to give up. Yeah. Times he wanted to quit. Times he just said, what was I doing? All I was doing, Lord, was going and checking on my brothers. And look what I've ended up. Time when Potiphar's wife done what he'd done to him, end up back in prison. What have I done? Done nothing but obey you. Done what I tried to do was right. You see, just because you obey the Lord don't mean things ain't going to come hard in your life. That's right. Blows these televangelists out of the water, don't it? They sit up there and lie all they want to. They fight the same demons. They fight the same thing. So here he's got this son. He said, man, this made me forget everything. Then the second one was born. In verse 52, the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God had caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. That's precious to me right there. God made him forget all his toil and you know, maybe during that time, Joseph may have sung a song like this. Look what the Lord has uh -huh. done. Think about that now. <laughs> he might have sat back holding that little boy and started singing something like it. Yeah. He's healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. I'm going to praise his name. I know that's a modern day song, but hey, he might have sung something to that note. He might have had those good times going on there in his life. So that second one named Ephraim. God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. See, he realized he was in affliction. He realized he wasn't where he was raised at. He was in the land of my afflictions, yet God caused him to be fruitful. The church, listen to me now, the church is full of Ephraim. God has blessed us even Amen. during our afflictions. Amen. If we could get up before the congregation this morning and expand on this a little bit so people could grasp what Ephraim means and we, we could have popcorn testimonies jumping up everywhere. There's a lot of Ephraims in the house of God. God has caused you to be fruitful during your afflictions. Let me get done with this chapter real quick. Verse 54. There was a famine in all the lands. 
plural if you look at that. But in all the land of Egypt, an ungodly nation, there was bread. Look at that. He said, And seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, plural. But, now it's the contrary, in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. But something's fixing to change. Over time, verse 55, the famine covered all the land of Egypt also. And the people cried to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, You go to the man of God, and whatever he tells you to do, that's what you're to do. He had so much confidence in Joseph. He was his right hand, he was his vice president, if you will. He said, I ain't even dealing with it. God's done showed me that favor in that man. He's done all this. You go to it. Whatever he tells you to do, you just do it. That ain't the first time we've seen that mm -hmm. in the life of Joseph. But it's on a grander scale now. Now, verse 56. The famine was so bad here over all the face of the earth. Joseph opened all the storehouses. And he sold them to the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. So eventually, it took place. It, it found even the land of Egypt that had all the storehouses it, it, beyond the sands of the sea, beyond number, yet it still touched them. You think about when Elijah prayed for it not to rain for three and a half years. Now we know in a future reference after that that there were 7,000 that didn't bow the knee to Baal. Just in that land. But there was people all over that knew God. And those people was his one man who prayed for it not to rain. Yet we know there was thousands begging for God to cause it to rain. Mm -hmm. I can remember we've been through a drought in this state. Mm -hmm. I remember Governor Deal standing on a, the square of the Capitol, or standing at the Capitol, saying, I'm calling for everybody to pray for rain. Y'all remember that? Yeah. <laughs> Think about this now. We can pray and beg and do whatever. If God don't want it to rain, it ain't going right. to rain. Right. It was one man that prayed for it not to rain for three and a half years. The creeks dried up. The, the cattle was dying. Mm -hmm. There was godly people. There were 7,000 we know of in the Word of God that didn't bow to need a bell. You know they was calling on Jehovah God for mm -hmm. it to rain. <laughs> and their families was affected. We seen the, the widow who said, I'm just going to I got enough to, to just go up here and bake a few cakes and we're going to eat it and we're going to die. Yet, God had one man there to do that. But it rains on the just and the unjust alike. Mm -hmm. So people was calling out. So even in this time of famine, it was over the whole land. So that means Joseph's brothers and all was affected. Mm -hmm. And that's what God's got to do yeah. to get them where he wants them to be. So Joseph opened these storehouses. Now, if Joseph hadn't had the wisdom to prepare, what would the result of the famine be? Think about that. Verse 57, I'm done. We begin to see one of the purposes of the famine. And that's to move God's people from where they were to where they need to be sustained. And all countries, plural. Man, word got out. There's corn in Egypt. Yes, it's an ungodly nation. Oh, but there's a man of God in place there. He's prepared. All countries came into Egypt. What, did they go to Pharaoh? Uh-uh. They went to Joseph mm -hmm. <laughs> for to buy corn. Because that the famine was so sore in all lands. Don't miss that in the Word of God. So what's happening here is God having to do some circumstances in 13 years to get a hold of some brothers. We're going to see it as we go on through this thing. Man. It's, it's amazing what God has to do to get His will done. Not what He has to do, but what He chooses to do. Amen? God could just speak it and be done. But God's got a purpose for us. Father, thank You for Your words this morning. We praise You. We love You in Jesus' name. Amen.